several years ago, I still remember it seems like yesterday, but time flies. One of the brethren asked me some pointed questions, kind of put me on the spot, didn't expect it, didn't see it coming, about the church of Laodicea. And the reason I remember the conversation was uh, the discussion centered around that I was part of a church that was Laodicean, and I myself was a Laodicean, and I needed to repent. And I don't disagree with needing to repent, uh, but it brought some interesting thoughts to mind. Today in the body of Christ, the church of God, we find ourselves in an interesting point in history. And the church is scattered, and still at times scattering, and that's not always a bad thing, by the way. Some would say, oh, that's horrible, but the body has many parts as God places them. But because of our dispersion, we at times, any of us, find ourselves unable maybe to do as great of a public work in the way that we had grown accustomed to in decades ago, or at least the perception. And the specifics of the future are quite uncertain, especially economically. If any of you feel completely settled in your economic situation, well, great. But you're a minority, I would say. We must continue to follow and preach the directive of the gospel personally and as a body as we are able. We must also examine ourselves individually daily to do indeed see if we are following our Creator and letting Him live in us. That's not just a one-time thing, a Passover. What are we to do individually and collectively, and what should our perspective be? Those are good questions, I think. Are there some lessons we can glean from our past? And by our past, I mean the history of the church of God. We can always find perspective from this, from the Word of God. We can find perspective from this and also from God's church or ecclesia in history. And today what I want to do is take, look at a, take a look at both, and I want to go and examine the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation. These are, as you well know, many have spoken on this, I have over the years. These are messages to the seven churches. So let's first of all lay a little groundwork and understand the importance of the Scriptures we're about to examine. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Here it is, the Revelation, singular, one entire revelation, of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly, shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that reads, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written, therefore, for the time is at hand. So the entire book of Revelation can be very difficult because of the Scriptures, the sections to understand. Some claim to understand it all, and I say, uh-huh, we understand it in part. And sometime in the future, I'll give a series of Bible studies on the book of Revelation. It usually brings in a larger a crowd attendance, more than normal for a number of reasons. Some, however, would render the entire book of Revelation to the realms of literature with little or no practical value. Others, the Church of England, for example, I'd like to quote, 
label sections of Revelation, including the two chapters we want to study today, off limits. You stay away from that. Here's a quote from Cease's Apocalypse. It says, In the Church of England, Archbishop Trench remarks, It is very much to be regretted that while every chapter of every other book of the New Testament <coughs> is set forth to be read in the church, wherever there is daily service is read in the church three times in the year and some or portions of some oftener, while even of the Apocalypse itself, two chapters and portions of others have been admitted into the service. But under no circumstances whatever can the second and third chapters ever be heard in the congregation. So it would seem that there's been a bit of effort throughout history to suppress these chapters and the message they carry. If you're like me, I like to ask questions and say, why? Why would they suppress those two chapters? Others would read those today and take liberty to claim to be one of those churches condemning all others including Sabbath keepers and stating that all others are another church also mentioned in these chapters. We must not make the mistake of dismissing or overlooking anything that is recorded or canonized in the Word of God. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, you know, western Turkey or Asia Minor, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And that's a whole other uh, sermon message. But here we have the message to the seven churches. Now, there are several ways to understand these messages. One of the ways is that these were literal churches on a mail route through Asia Minor, and the messages were for them in that day only. And some will teach that. Another understanding is they represent symbolically in the church of God, the body of Christ, in different eras through down through the ages. And it would indicate perhaps a prophetic reference to a general sense, or more appropriately, an attitude within the church at that time. We, uh, the Church of God Ministries, I do not attempt to define exactly where we are in church history. Oh, well, we all know. No, we don't. The only comment I might suggest is that many expositors believe that in addition to the obvious implication of these messages of the seven churches, represent the chronological development of church history viewed spiritually, that Ephesus seems to be characteristics of the apostolic period in general, the progression of evil climaxing into Laodicea seems to indicate the final state of apostasy in the church. The order of the messages to the churches seems to be divinely selected to give prophetically the main movement of church history. Now that's a quote from John Wolford, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, page 51 to 52 from 1989. The overall message, I might add, of course, is that Christ reveals the dominant strengths and weaknesses of the church both in John's day and through the ages. He plainly tells each congregation, he who has an ear, this is from Revelation 2, Verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That is the emphasis that we should apply both the praise and the warnings that Christ gave to all seven churches. Last night, my letter I sent out, or yesterday, my weekly pastoral Friday night letter, I talked about, do we take these warnings to heart? And a third perspective is that these churches represent attitudes among the people of God, any or of all which may be present with some at any given point or time. An individual may migrate from one attitude 
to another at different times in his or her Christian life. When I read these verses, I ask myself, am I having any or all of these attitudes mentioned, good or bad? I look in the mirror and say, and, and, and in prayer to God and in studying, do I have any of these? Therefore, there are lessons to be learned by all of us. In fact, at the end of each section, often referred to as epistles by commentators, we are told to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Have you ever had someone say to you, now listen to me. Listen to your mom or dad, or listen to your boss, or listen to your husband or wife, or listen to the police officer. You know, listen to what I'm saying to you. We are to be in tune with what God wants us to hear, see, and become. It's interesting, it says, this world is blinded by a great being. When you're blind, you don't see, do you? Have you ever had where you're maybe tired or you're not tired, you're just kind of in la-la land and you drive four or five hours and you pull into your driveway and you turn the car off and you're like, whoa, that was scary. I don't remember anything from when I left. You ever have that happen to you? Well, maybe you weren't blind, but you weren't paying attention. You just kind of go through that. And that can happen. You can go along in life, especially if... If your job's going well, and your health is well, and your fellowship is well, and your friends is well, and your country's well, and you can go and do what you want, and you're just, it's all good. And one day you're like, where did the last five years go? What have I done? And maybe something happens and you're like, God, help me. And he's like, I'm here. Where you been? Right? And so... We want to be in tune with what God wants us to hear, see, and then become. Sometimes, some want to reject the idea of the church errors because they feel it has been overdone in the past and has led to judgmental attitudes on the part of some. And I I understand that concern. However, we need to be really careful here because we don't reject something with validity and truth just because someone else has abused it. I won't have time today to bring in the historicity, if you want to call that, of the church eras, but it appears the evidence may point to a definite division of church history into eras that fit the outline of Revelation 2 and 3. So why did God, let's talk about this, why did God choose seven, these seven particular cities? He could have picked other ones. Why these? You know, the book of Acts, we don't believe, is completely finished. What's going to happen someday when it says, well, here's the tour story of Scott Hofker. be a pretty boring one. Here's the story of, and I won't mention any names here to embarrass anyone, but your name in there. And you might ask, why would you choose me? Why would we choose you? When there's all these other more interesting stories. Well, why did he choose these particular seven cities? Here are a few thoughts. First of all, they were on a mail route. We know that from history. They were different in many ways, and they came from different ethnic, educational, religious backgrounds, but they were bound together by the mail route, much the same as we all here and online and those who listen. God's people are from different backgrounds, but we're bound together by the Spirit of God. There's no way that some of us would be friends or know each other if it weren't for the commonality of God's Spirit. We're very different. You can tell that. Just go to different parts of the country and watch people. Or even here during tourist season. It's quite comical sometimes to look at the variances of what folks are, how they are. But we're bound together by the Spirit of God. The cities or the history of the cities provides significant reference 
that would be recognized or researched by the church that can then be learned from. For example, today, and I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but if I mention Key West, San Francisco, or New Orleans, or New Orleans, what comes to mind? Different type of people that live there. If I mention Nebraska, or South Dakota, or North Dakota, I'm going to get a different response than Oregon, or Washington, or Florida, or L.A., Lower Alabama, right? Or Jersey, or New York, or Canadians. It's a generality, but very different. So we can learn from them. The male progressed or progressed from one city to the other, starting with Ephesus, and it ended with Laodicea. In like manner, the church of God would progress down through the centuries, beginning with Ephesus and ending with Laodicea near the time of the return of Jesus Christ. In a broad sense. So let's go through, let's begin in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 2, and I don't know if you can see my Bible, but I don't know if that shows up on the screen or not, but you can see how the verses, I have it segmented out into 1 and 2 and 3, so I can, just the way I think, keep track of where I am. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, <coughs> under the angel of the church of Ephesus, you know, this was a Roman mail route that started there in Ephesus. These things, he said, that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works and the labor and your patience. That word can also mean steadfast or endurance. But I know your works and how you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and not, and has found them liars. Ouch. Ouch. That's pretty strong. The word for evil is cacus. It means, you know, a bench warmer. You just don't do anything. You just sit and observe. And you talk big words, but you don't do anything. And is born and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. You notice it doesn't say Christ is coming in here. You notice that? It doesn't say he's coming back soon or he's coming back. Nevertheless, I have something against you because you have left your first love. And I'd be reading this and I read this, I'm like, ouch. Remember, therefore, from when you are fallen, and repent, and do your first works, or else I will come unto you quickly, remove your candlestick out of your place, except you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And by the way, those deeds exist today in this nation, in this world. That's a whole other message. He that has an ear, so you got an ear or ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches, better translated, the verb tense, to him that overcomes or is overcoming, I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This leading coastal city with a large harbor was the most easily accessible city in Asia Minor by land or by sea. It had a great temple to Diana. The people were of a progressive thought, both politically and religiously. Does that sound anything like we know? In verse 2, there were works and perseverance. There was study, examination, and discernment because it was one thing to claim to be an apostle, or a servant of God, and quite another to have the fruits to prove it. We still see today, unfortunately, spiritual leaders, don't we, who 
fall into this. They claim, but you look at the fruits. But maybe, I don't know, maybe we're too busy to even notice or care. Verse 4, it says, They didn't give up and walk away, which is a natural human tendency to just to say, forget it. I'm, I'm out of here. And verse 5, but they were losing their first love. And that's something we need to be on guard of constantly. Have we lost it at times? Their zeal for the truth and for each other was waning. I appreciate the privilege to have open dialogue and discussion with many parts of the body of Christ. It's interesting. Some don't want to talk about anything, but most do. And so we have to ask ourselves, is our love and our zeal for the truth for each other, is it waning? Second Thessalonians, let's go over there for a moment, please. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse 9, that first love and zeal for the truth, if we lose it or we let it go, it will make us open pickings, if you will, for a strong delusion. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and miracles and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that are perishing because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. We need to be constantly on guard for believing lies both in the world and in the church, my friends. Does God want a half-hearted child? Someone who just does just enough to be okay, but not any more and not any less. John chapter 13 talks about this love for the truth and dedication John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my students if you have love one to another. A strong love one for another and a dedication to truth will have an effect on how we approach our fellow brethren. And let me add fellowships. Because it's fact, we know, there are some that won't talk to other people if you're not part of them. That's not good for any of us. We can become that way. Well, I'm not talking to them. You know, the famous line, they left the church. That's pretty strong words, but You have to ask yourself. And what I'm finding, the more I interact and travel and talk with people, there's a lot of people that may not be part of a certain fellowship, but they're out there studying, desiring to continue to obey and follow God and searching to be fellowship. And they said, you can't come here, sorry, because if you're not part of us, your own family can't come here. And that's not healthy and it's not biblical. And I challenge any of you to prove that from the Bible. So a lack of love for the truth will result in a lack of love for each other. So Ephesus lost their love and became a cold church. Revelation chapter 2. Let's go back. Let's move on. So Ephesus, they lost their love and they became a cold church. You know what I've heard over the years from many? The reason I left this fellowship It's because they were so cold. If you didn't fit their mold, they were cold to you. I didn't feel welcome. 
Let's move to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8. And under the angel of the church of Smyrna, we've now moved to Smyrna. You know, it could mean myrrh. The more you, you know, you have this plant, becomes fragrant, you brush against it, becomes fragrant. So the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last which was dead and is alive. I know your works. God knows our works. No one else may see your works but God, but God knows. And that's who we live for. Not so your minister, your fellowship, your neighbor, your brother, your, your boss can see you. I used to have employees, quite a few. And I chuckled because when I would come on a job site to help or whatever, they worked differently. And sometimes, you know, people would call and say, they've been out here for 45 minutes in the van with their feet up on the dash taking a siesta. They never could quite get all their work done because they were so tired, they said. But, but when I went with them, we got it all done a couple hours early. Well, I was helping, but human nature... He said, so God says, I know your works and your tribulation and your physical poverty, which is talking to God. But he said, you are rich spiritually. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer persecution. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison, that you may be tried and shall have tribulation ten days. But be you faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. So Smyrna was a great trading center though the name is symbolic of death, it was celebrated for schools of science and medicine. Science. It's all about science and medicine. Polycarp was martyred here by the Jews. It is the only one of the seven cities listed that is still a flourishing community. In verse 9, again, there are works and perseverance. But the church here suffered greatly, apparently suffering economic sanctions as well as physical martyrdom. The Jews at that time were particularly intolerant of the newly forming Christian church. And in verse 10, as a result, they were a beaten down church. They withdrew and they had to be encouraged to hold on. And reminded that God will indeed reward them for their faithfulness if they don't quit. When things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you travel seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, stop and rest and you have to sigh, but don't you quit. You might recognize that. Don't quit. You know, every Friday night I write, arms up. What's that mean? I'm going to rob you? No, it means arms up. You remember the story of Moses. As long as his hands and arms were up, the battle was won. When they started to fall, so they propped his arms up. Arms up. It means don't quit. If some of you have not faced yet the opportunity to say, I've had it, I quit. You haven't been doing this very long. Because you'll reach a point and say, "Ah, I can't take it anymore. God says, yes, you can. Let me live in you. We got this. I've got this, God says. Matthew chapter 10. Let's go back there for a minute. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 21. The persecution from one place to another, but the endurance to the end is what's important. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death and the father the child the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but he that endures to the end shall be saved 
Some of you wonder why your family doesn't want anything to do with you. Sadly, sometimes it's in the church. They don't want anything to do with you because for whatever their reasons are. And what does God say? He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So Smyrna was persecuted. They barely held on to the truth. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12. Verse 12. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, he writes, These things says he which has the sharp sword with two edges. I know your works. Again, I know your works. And where you dwell even where Satan's seed is, and you hold fast my name, have not denied my faith, even in these days wherein Antipas, okay, Latin means Antipater, against the Father or against, was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Oh, this is the part you always read. (laughs) Scott, you've done a great job, but I have a few things against you. You're just like, oh, man. But I have a few things against you because you have, you has there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Numbers chapter 25 and 31 talk about that. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice unto idols, and to commit spiritual fornication, physically and spiritually. So have you also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Again, Nikos, conqueror, Laos, people, the Babylonian system, related partly to Nimrod, which things I hate. If we try to have syncretism in the body of Christ to fit in with the world, because, hey, we don't want to make waves or get anybody offended Because we want to soften the Word of God. What's he going to say? I hate those things. But yet some will say, ooh, ooh, be careful. Don't want to get too strong. They'll think we're weird. We'll get persecuted. (coughs) Repent, or else I will come unto you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I will give to eat of the hidden manna. John chapter 6 talks about that bread from heaven, Jesus Christ eating of him daily, that you will not die. And I will give him a white stone and the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saying, except he that receives it. (coughs) Pergamos was one of the greatest cities of the East. Art and literature flourished. It blossomed. And it boasted a library of 200,000 volumes. It had the altar of Zeus, considered to be one of the wonders of the ancient world and a chief religious city of the province. One historian wrote that it was given to idolatry more than all of Asia. In verse 13 of Revelation 2 There were works, and they held fast in spite of persecution with the religiosity of the area. And the altar of Zeus, it appears that demonic activity perhaps was also flourishing. We currently in this world, I want you to listen, please. We currently in this world face a spiritual battle. A spiritual battle. And frankly, if you cannot discern that's behind all this craziness, I would encourage you to draw closer to God. It is way bigger than a little physical virus that a few folks have died from. Some have died. It's way bigger than that. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I just look at God's Word and I look at human nature and I look at what's happening and it's like, wow. That's why we need to have the whole armor of God. I've got a, a up here the full armor of God. 
This would be good to study. Go back. The helmet of hope and salvation. Your loins girt about with truth. The breastplate of righteousness which goes all across the back and the front. Your feet shed with what? The preparation of the gospel of peace. Study what that means. A two-edged sword rightly dividing, sharp cutting to the innermost parts of the soul, the Word of God. What else? Hmm? The shield of faith, the faith of Jesus Christ living in it, by which we withstand all the fiery darts of the evil one. A dart that's fiery goes in. If you've ever watched any movies or read your, in history literature, it goes in, you can't pull it out, and then it just starts burning. Horrible experience. Do we have the whole armor of God? Does it fit properly? Is it shiny? Is it ready for battle? Your loins girt about with truth. I don't think I missed one, did I? Maybe I did. <clears throat> We're in a spiritual battle behind all this craziness. But the pressure of the era here at Pergamos combined with the backgrounds caused them to compromise with the truth. In verse 15 it says they had many different beliefs that are attributed to the Nicolaitans, but it seems clear they pursued the freedom of the flesh. They may have been among those folks who felt, the more we sin, the more God can forgive, which glorifies His name. It's a very dysfunctional thinking, but not uncommon today, even in the body of Christ at times. Well, the more we do this stuff, then that God can forgive us more. You may say, people don't think that way. Some do. In Jude chapter 1, verse 3, and it's Jude, there's not chapters. Jude, verse 3, he said, Behold, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was indeed needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. There's always going to be pressure to compromise with the faith. But we have to remain mentally and spiritually sharp, contend earnestly for the true faith delivered to us. It's never going to be easy. You know why? Because this is not God's world. That's why I won't sing the song, This is my Father's world. It isn't. It's our adversaries right now. The prince of the power of the air, it's his world. It says the God of this world. Now, he loves all of the sinners, and they'll have an opportunity, but what's going to happen when eventually God the Father comes down to earth? It's all going to get burned up before. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and he'll come for the first time and dwell with men. That's why it's not easy. And the harder you work, the old saying, the hurrier you go, the behinder you get. Right? You want to know why sometimes you don't sleep well? You don't feel well. You just feel kind of down. Anybody else face that? And you can't really explain it. You're being pounded, as God allows. Right? From whence come all these things among you? So, Pergamos was weak and quickly compromised with the faith. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 2. The verse 18 to 29, there's several verses here. And under the angel of the church of Thyatira. There's a lot of church history here. These things says the Son of God, which has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like polished brass. I know your works, charity, service, faith, and your patience, and your works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. <laughs> because you suffered that woman Jezebel, 
which called herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And there's a whole other message in that verse. And I gave her space to repent of her fornications and she did not repent. She just kept right on doing it. Behold, I will cast her into bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which search the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. And take note of that, folks. You might get away with a few things in this life. But God knows your works. And he knows what you've done to folks. And he says you're going to be rewarded to that. But unto you I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known of the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already held fast till I come. He that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him I will give power. We talked about power last week over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of potter shall be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. You know, that Greek meaning that superior, that strong, that strength. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So Thyatira was a wealthy town, but never became a metropolis. It was the smallest of the seven churches, well known for most highly and extensively organized trade guilds of the time. It had a temple to Sam Beth, which was a prophetess who would pass on the words of God to the worshipers. End quote. Verse 19, apparently the church started out weakly and it grew in strength as time went along. The prophetess it talks about, we don't know for sure what the doctrines of the temple were, but it seems clear that this was a corrupt area. The church, unfortunately, followed some of that. Verse 24, God makes it clear that not all who considered themselves to be Christians are accepted by Him. Let me repeat that. Not all who considered themselves to be Christians are accepted by Him. Their corruption defined them, and God rejected them. Matthew chapter 7. Let's go back there for a minute. Matthew chapter 7. There's some huge warnings in here, friends. It is all through here for all of us. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not every person that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. And you better make sure you're doing God's will, not what you think is God's will. And there's a whole lot of that. Many will come to me in that day, Lord, have we not preached and prophesied in your name? And in your name we cast out demons? And in the name done many other wondrous works. And then he said, I will profess unto you. I don't know you. I never did. Depart from me. Get away from me, you that work lawlessness or iniquity. There were, are, and will be some who deceive themselves into thinking they are Christians. But their actions, the way they live, deny such, a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And I can look at me, and you can look at you, and just ask yourself, do we fit into that at times? Do we repent of that? Incomplete knowledge and understanding, the church, Thyatira, they were able to hold on to what they did have tenaciously, some of them. And Thyatira was deceived and corrupt. Many exchanged truth for what was expedient. Let's make sure we don't do that. Exchange the truth for what is expedient, tradition, accepted, what we've always done, or what we need to do to not make 
a huge dent in society that we're weird. You know? I've had people tell me over the years, you're a really nice guy except for that weird, stupid religion you have. Let's go back to Revelation. Now move to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis, and we have in the past given specific dates and names of people and people you would remember, you know, Peter Waldo, the Waldensians, and we labeled this all down. We had it all worked out, this perfect little thing, and this is who it was, and maybe some of that, perhaps. And the angel of the church of Sardis write these things, he said, the seven spirits of God, the seven stars, I know your works, which you have a name, so you're called the church of God, that you lived but are walking dead, as it should be translated. You're, le- you're walking, but you're dead. You ever, we have a saying in English, man, I'm dead tired. That means you're moving, but your brain is mush. You ever had that? You just, maybe you've been working all day on the computer or whatever you've been doing, you sit in a chair and it's like, I'm my brain, I'm, I'm, I can walk to the kitchen, but I'm, I'm brain dead. Don't ask me anything. What's one plus one? I don't know. I don't care. So, He said, a walking dead, be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come to you as a thief. He doesn't say that to any the other churches. I will come as a thief, and you shall not know what hour will come upon you. And you have a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So Sardis was one of the oldest and most important cities in Asia Minor. It sat on the northern slope of Mount Timolus with the mountain protecting the southern approach. The Pactolus River flowed on the other side of the city, creating kind of a natural moat. With careful attention, it was almost impregnable. But the mount, as we know, was scaled by a Median soldier in 549 B.C. and again by a Cretan in 218 B.C. It was later sacked and burned, and it never regained its prominence in the region. What's the lesson with this? You can think you're strong spiritually and you're on top of your game, but if you don't stay there, you can fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Take heed. He, I think it's 10, 12. He who takes heed or, or thinks he stands, take heed lest you fall. I learned that ice skating years ago. Going along, whoo, man, all of a sudden, whoo, down you go. There were some works, but by and large, this church was spiritually dead. They were instructed to be watchful. Like the city, through the pure lack of watching and the lack of effort, they were taken. My letter last night again, take warnings to heart. I meant what I said. I hope you read it. Much truth appears to have been lost with this era, but God's Spirit was still here. Second Timothy, let's go over there, or back there, Second Timothy chapter 1, and we've read this often, but verse 6. Wherefore, Paul says, I put you in remembrance that you stir up the Spirit of God, which is in you by the putting on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. That word, pharma, or parmonia, or phobia, paranoia, of love and of a sound mind. Okay? Are we scared? 
Some are scared to death. Scared to death right now. Are we scared? Are we fearful? God's Spirit is a gift. It's a tool that we have to use. And it must be stirred up through that relationship with God. If we spend as much time worrying about getting the virus as we did drawing close to God, it would sure change a lot of people. Oh, I wear a mask. Do your research. Sorry. Do your research. Okay, we have some here in the medical community. Talk to many. Bonafide, board certified, United States, Harvard, Yale, good university medical doctors. Are we afraid? What are you afraid of? God's Spirit is not that. We must take an active part in our calling, stir up this gift given to us by God, or what's going to happen? We will accomplish nothing. In fact, our faith will die within us. Sardis was a dying church with dead or dying faith. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 3. We're getting down to the two most commonly spoken of, talked about in my lifetime. Revelation chapter 3. And let's go to verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. I've been to Philadelphia, the church, the city of brotherly love here in Pennsylvania. He writes, These things shall he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David... He that opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. I know your works. And I have set before you an open door. No man can shut it for you have a little strength. And actually it should be a very little strength. And you have kept my word and has not denied my name. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews. You know they're spiritually converted and are not but they lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my patience. I will also keep them from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them to dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which you have that no man takes your crown. Don't let a man or a fellowship, or a focus, or a whatever it is, take you away from God. Take that crown. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which just should say New Jerusalem, which is, was added, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Philadelphia was the youngest city, founded in 189 B.C. It stood on a terrace about 650 feet above the sea. It had a stable economy, bolstered by fertile farming ground all around. Some of the coastal cities declined in importance and wealth. It kept growing. In verse 8, there were works... And doors were open, but of themselves they had little strength. Verse 10, in times of testing and trial, they did hold fast, and they would not give in to great pressure. Verse 11, this says it could be arguable that they did not understand the whole truth. Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12 Let's go back there. Luke chapter 12, verse 43. <clears throat> Blessed is that servant when his Lord, when he comes, shall find him so doing. Of truth I will say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. 
But if that servant says in his heart, Oh, my Lord delays his coming, and begins to meet the men, beat the men servants and maid servants and eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of the servant will come in the day which he looks not for him, and an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him asunder, will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will did not prepare himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that did not know and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few. For unto whom much is given, him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. The church at that point was apparently given much. And interestingly, it is one of only two for whom no correction is given. What is required is what we do. We do all we can with the wonderful opportunities we've been given. Do we do that? Philadelphia was a faithful church that continued in the truth despite the trials. Let's go to the final one today. Revelation chapter 3 back to verse 14. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea, I hear this, this is what I began the sermon with today. I hear this talked about a lot. Everybody seems to know who the Laodicean church is because they know it's not them. Right? That's everybody else, not your group, not this figurehead. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea, right, these things says the amen, the so be it, the faithful and the witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Okay, the beginner, as it should read. And I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. You know, it's a primary verb. One is hot, to boil, to glow, to be fervent or earnest with burning desire. I wish that you were cold or hot. Cold meaning absolute zero. Either on fire or frozen. How many of you like on fire ice cream? Right? How many of you like, got to be careful here, cold leg of lamb? <laughs> Maybe you do. You know? How many of you like your burger served at the table cold, ice cold? They just brought it out of the freezer and here you go. Wait till it thaws out, you could eat it. Right? How many of you like, like we used to have, your morning cereal when you travel and they brought you out a bag of warm milk to put on it? Now, maybe it's a cultural thing. He says, I wish you were either cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, kind of meh, neither cold or hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, I have need of nothing. I know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I could translate what that means, but I would offend a few. Oh, why not? We have the perfect form of governance. We have the perfect doctrinal understanding. Why, we've researched it all. Well, we can learn a little bit, but we got it down. We haven't heard any of those things, thankfully. He said, you are rich and increased with goods, have need of nothing, and you know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy me gold tried in great tribulation, that you may be rich spiritually of character in white raiment, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness doesn't appear. Anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. that you can actually see yourselves, ourselves, as we are. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I stand at the door, and I'm knocking. Someone's knocking at the door. Somebody ringing a bell. Do me a favor. Open it up and let them in. Remember that song? Somebody's knocking. 
They're knocking at the door. They're ringing the doorbell. The phone's ringing. The alarm's going off. That applies to everybody else, not me. I'm, you understand I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> I've got to be careful. He said that doesn't apply to him, but it applies to all of us. He said, open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, eat with you and with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat now with my father at his throne. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, originally populated by Syrians and Jews who had been deported, Laodicean was a place of little consequence until Roman times when it quickly grew in wealth and importance. It was destroyed by an earthquake, 60 A.D. or so, but was so wealthy they rejected monetary aid from Rome and they rebuilt the city themselves. He had quite an extensive banking system. Laodicean was well known in the ancient world for its wealth. For example, this is from Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary. In 62 B.C., Flaccus seized the annual contribution of the Jews of Laodicean for Jerusalem amounting to 20 pounds of gold. So even today, 20 pounds of gold, if I had that, would can't eat it. But The extent of its wealth is illustrated by the fact that Laodicean was rebuilt without the financial help of Rome after the disastrous earthquake of 60 A.D. Laodicean earned its wealth in the textile industry, in the production of black wool, and in the banking industry. Laodicean was also known for its medical school, its school of ophthalmology which concocted a spice nard for the treatment of ears and an eye salve. The major weakness of Laodicea was its lack of water supply. There's all kinds of analogies here. The need was met by bringing water six miles north from Denzili through a system of stone pipes. Water conveyed to Laodicea through these pipes was lukewarm by the time it reached the city. That's from Holman's Bible Dictionary. The eye salve, interesting, was called calyrium. Probably a reference to how it was applied, the form of a plaster or a poultice. In eye care, calyrium, if I remember, uh, is an antique term for like a lotion of liquid wash used as a cleanser for the eyes when you have disease. The word calyrium comes from the Greek meaning eye salve. The same name was given to uguents used for the same purpose used as an unguent of tutty. Now, what's tutty? Um, it's an oxide of zinc. Here's some interesting details from a friend of ours that Gail and I know, who kept the Feast of Tabernacles when it was hosted in Turkey many years ago. I won't mention her name because I didn't get her permission. But we had this conversation more than once. Laodicean is about 10 kilometers south of Heropolis. Heropolis is the site of Pamukkale, the name of natural hot springs for millennia have poured out over the hillside. Topographically, Laodicean is on the lower plain and the hot springs of Pamukkale or at the top of the plateau, so they trickle down the side of the plateau, creating a cascade of little pools that are bright white from the calcium in the water. It is because of the hot springs that the plateau hillside is white. I think uh, Pak. Pamukkail even means um, cotton clouds, I think is what she said, like puffy cumulonimbus clouds. But the result is that from Laodicea you can see the bright white bluffs of Heropolis and Pamukkale. It was a source of water for Laodicea that had cooled to a lukewarm by the time it got down to Laodicea. Even the pipes and the aqueducts still have that white calcium that you can see in the ruins. She said, looking the other direction... About 11 miles away was Colossae, now completely ruined, just some grass and a curve and a hill where the stadium used to be due to an earthquake that hit. That was 60 AD. Part of the Lycos Valley, Colossae had cool water that when it traveled toward Laodicea via aqueducts, warmed up in the sun to a lukewarm temperature. You can easily see on the historic maps that these three towns make up this tri-city area. And she said, to her it's always been fascinating that these three cities within 20 miles of each other were so accessible. 
Even on foot, someone in Laodicea could have moved from their lukewarm water to either Herapolis, where there was hot water, or Colossae, where it was cool. Perhaps that was another lens Paul was making about the riches of Laodicea. Christ, which I might say is always the quintessential teacher, he integrated these well-known facts about Laodicea into his spiritual message about them. Jesus said the same thing about the spiritual lessons he drew from Laodicea that he said about each of the seven churches. In verse 22, you remember it said of the last cha- or chapter 3, He who has an ear or ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the question I have, are you connected with that Spirit that you can hear what God is saying to His people, to the body of Christ? Or are you brain dead? Just cruising along. It's all good. Some have said, how could this virus all of a sudden appear out of nowhere? Because the spiritual virus has been here for millennia. Just that the maker of it has ramped it up. Feel the pressure? The closer you get to God, the more you'll see that and you'll feel it. You know, It's entirely possible that Jesus intended to embed a chronological prophecy of successive eras characterized by the predominant strengths and weaknesses of the seven churches and those cities in which they were located. In recent years, unfortunately, some seem to focus more on that possibility, but we can't know for certain. We need to apply all the lessons of these messages of the churches to ourselves. Stop pointing the finger at, well, they're this, they're that, but look at me. Right? I don't think there's anything godly or helpful in one person or group pointing the finger of judgment, declaring another person or group to be Laodiceans. But it is wise for each of us to be on guard against that Laodicean weakness in ourselves. In verse 15, they were indifferent to most everything, including the truth. Even the works they did were indifferent. Uh, No biggie. You can call it this. You know, somebody said, why do you get on this kick about keeping the Feast of Tabernacles seven days? Because it says so many times in that one chapter, seven days. Oh, you're just too rigid. So be it. They could have used help and taken help from Rome, but they felt, we don't need it. I used to serve, and people would have questions about doctrine, and I was always hesitant to bring it up because very seldom folks ever got a response. Oh, we already know that. Just tell them we already know that. We don't need to research that anymore. We've already proven that. The name Laodicean literally means the people define their justice or deciding to one's self what is right. I'll decide how I want to worship God. I'll decide what I do. I'll decide if I obey God. I'll decide if I believe this or not. Verse 18, perhaps one of the strongest traits of Laodicean attitude is that, stay with me, he or she is convinced they aren't one. I'm not one because I'm here or I'm this way or I do all these things. And what does he say? Your righteousness is as a filthy cloth. I won't go in the description it gives. It's pretty nasty. So if you think you got everything together, take heed if you think you stand, lest you fall. For any of us. God counsels them to counsel, Luke 7, 30, the same word, to seek the will of God. You better make sure you're doing God's will. Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12 is an interesting verse, or two, three. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. 
You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord nor faint when you are rebuked of him. From whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure that, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is whom the Father chastens not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers and they are illegitimate, and not his sons. You and I need to be sensitive to and receptive of correction from God. We must seek his will and not what we think is his will. He will give us opportunities to change our attitudes and behavior, but he's not going to force us. It requires humility that was completely lacking in Laodicean. Laodicea was a church, friends, that needed to repent. It was the body of Christ that needed to repent and seek God's will and not their own. The future is certain to be anything but, as I say, so terrific and ho-hum. There's tremendous and powerful forces at work around the globe to bring mankind, if you will, to a fever pitch, a state of extreme agitation or excitement of activities that will culminate in the prophesied calamities at the end of this age. It's coming. Do you hear it? It's coming. Within the church or the body of Christ, there are also prophetic and historical forces at work. The Word of God and the specter, the overview of history, give us insight and perspective. And these epistles to the seven churches contain some very powerful lessons. I have a question I'd like to leave you with today. Will you, will I, learn the lessons of the seven churches? Join me in prayer if you would as we finish. Our Father in heaven, God, we come before your throne in Jesus Christ at your right hand. We thank you. We love you. We appreciate the blessing of knowing you. And Father, help us to take to heart the warnings that you give us and the teachings and the edification through the knowledge, through your word, that we can have the cleansing, the washing of the word, Father. Give us strength and your spirit protection from the evil one and his minions and this world to live in it, to be a light and example, to share a positive focus, to not be afraid, to not just knuckle under and submit to a way, Father, that is not of you or Jesus Christ, to have our eyes open, to discern, to live powerfully with your Spirit, and to endure to the end, it says, the same shall be saved. Father, they can destroy physically this body, but spiritually, Father, that connection with you living in us, they can't. We pray your kingdom come. We pray your will be done. We look forward to that return. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. We ask dismissal, blessing on the meal, and protect and be with all of us and continue to bless us as your children as we do your work. We ask that and thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.